Jenny or Sarah or Karina, um, I don't have the ability to hide your video. I think uh, the host has to do it or either of you have to do it yourselves. Okay. Jenny or Sarah or Karina, um, I don't have the ability to hide your video. I think uh, the host has to do it or either of you have. Yeah. Sarah, that worked, you're out of sight. And Jenny, I think my the YouTube is sound is playing on your computer because when I just spoke it. Um... So we are live now. I did just close that screen. OK. And I just hit the broadcast button. Um, so we are ready to go. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Sustainable Princeton's Great Ideas event, Shrink Your Footprint on Your Plate. My name is Christine Symington, and I am the program director at Sustainable Princeton. We would like to thank our sponsor, Energy, Energy for making this program possible, and also to Princeton Public Library for their longtime partnership in our Great Ideas program. Jenny, could you advance to the next slide, please? Okay, uh, let's check the uh, results of our poll. Um, let's see what we have here. All right, looks like we've got 41% folks say that they're an omnivore. They're the type of foodie that eats anything. Followed by flexitarian, which is someone that eats primarily a vegetarian diet, occasionally meat. And then third is vegan, does not eat foods produced by animals. So thank you for taking the time to to fill out this poll and uh, we hope that for wherever you are on that spectrum that there's something um, for you to learn about this evening. Okay, next slide, Jenny. Okay, before we begin, we have a couple of housekeeping items to take care of. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on Sustainable Princeton's website shortly after this evening. Participants are in listen-only mode, and we'll have a Q&A session after the last panelist. Please enter questions at any time using the Q&A button in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Next, please mark your calendar for our next Ask an Expert event. The event is this upcoming Tuesday, June 9th at 7 p.m. Mike Van Clef who is the Stewardship Director of the Friends of Hopewell Valley Open Space and Program Director at the New Jersey Invasive Species Strike Team, will be available to answer questions about gardening with New Jersey native plants and controlling invasive species. By attending this event and implementing Mike's advice, you will be helping Princeton achieve its Climate Action Plan vision 
that all Princeton community members benefit from a healthy and resilient ecosystem. Planting more native species and reducing the spread of invasives helps protect and enhance our natural resources. It provides carbon capture, reduces flooding, and reduces the urban heat island effect. Next slide. And our last housekeeping item is to let you know that more information about how you can reduce your carbon footprint can be found on our website by going to sustainableprinceton.org and clicking on the Take Action link. Before I hand it over to our moderator, we would like to take a moment to acknowledge that systemic inequality and racial injustice still exist in our society. Racial justice, environmental justice, and sustainability are inseparable. Sustainable Princeton stands in solidarity with the Black community and all who support equity, justice, and inclusion. Please join us in a moment of reflection to respect those that have suffered unjustly and to think about the actions we must take to bring an end to racism. Thank you, everyone. Now I'd like to introduce our moderator, Steve Averbush. Steve is a trustee of Sustainable Princeton. He's a retired medical oncologist, physician scientist. He's the retired head of precision medicine from Bristol Myers Squibb and a consultant to biotech and nonprofit cancer organizations. Over to you, Steve. Thank you, Christine. It's my extreme pleasure to be moderating this event tonight. We have an exciting panel of experts lined up to speak about food and its impact on the environment. But before we begin the program, I'd like to reflect a little bit about the Princeton Climate Action Plan. Last summer, the Princeton community adopted the Climate Action Plan with the goal to reduce emissions by 80% by the year 2050. What impressed me most is how this plan came across from a grassroots effort across all sector of our, sectors of our community. So this plan should be thought of collectively as our plan, something for us all to embrace and implement within the Princeton community. Tonight's effort, event is part of Sustainable Princeton's effort to help individuals understand the impact that our daily lives have on climate change and what we can do to mitigate our impact on the, our environment, both locally and globally. Next slide. Next slide, Jim. thank you. The Climate Action Plan enumerated a number of sources that contribute to our carbon footprint. And all of this is based on very sound scientific data. The previous events in this great idea series address the emissions resulting from our transportation, our homes, and the things we buy. I encourage all of you to visit the Sustainable Princeton website, to watch the recordings of those past events, and to read the blog with the key takeaways from those sessions. Tonight's event will do a deep dive from emissions that result from food. The Climate Action Plan Materials Management section outlines three key objectives for implementation. The first is to reduce life cycle emissions. Can you go forward, Jenny? Thank you. The first is to reduce life cycle emissions occurring outside the community from products and services used by the Princeton community. Anu Ramaswamy, our first speaker, We'll speak to this objective. Next slide shows the second objective, which is to reduce life cycle emissions from the use of products and services within the community. Our second speaker, Karina Pierce Lamalfa, will address this issue by reviewing the art of sustainable eating. And the third objective shown on the following slide is to reduce life cycle emissions from the disposal of waste generated by the Princeton community. Sarah 
Alna, Alnica will be presenting her views on preventing food waste at home. Next slide. So before I turn over to our expert panel, I just wanted to take a moment to share my personal journey with respect to my food choice and its impact on the environment. A year ago, I was a typical omnivore, eating the occasional steak and lamb. My particular vice was a craving for fast food burgers every week, making that visit to Burger King or Wendy's. And around that time, after watching the groundbreaking and excellent documentary, Game Changers, and seeing firsthand the data behind the huge carbon footprint that my consumption from a quarter pounder has on the, on the environment, I stopped eating beef and lamb cold turkey. No pun intended. <laughs> I still have that fast food craving that I now satisfy with an impossible Whopper. And you can see here on this slide that by doing so, I've reduced my personal CO2 emission equivalent tenfold, my water consumption 50-fold, and my land use almost 20-fold from this personal choice change. I admit as a physician that my food choice may not be healthier for me, but the impact, the environmental impact is profound. Next slide. So as you listen to our upcoming speakers, I hope that you'll keep in mind at least the four key points. Today's program is about food. You are what you eat. And the points are that what you're gonna learn tonight is healthy for the planet. It doesn't have to be vegan. It doesn't have to be an extreme personal choice. And it can be delicious, whatever that personal choice is. And of course, as a bonus and a dividend, it will be healthier for you if you make some of these choices. So without further ado, let me introduce our first speaker of the evening, Professor Anu Ramaswamy, who's the Sanjay Swamy 87 Professor of India Studies and Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering and the Princeton Environmental Institute at Princeton University. Um, Anu, over to you. You're on mute, Anu. There you go. Give me just a minute to upload this presentation. Um, are you able to see it? It was uploaded just a minute back. Sorry here. We don't see it yet, Anu. Ah, it's coming okay. in. There it is. Okay, wonderful. Great. So thank you for having me. Um, I just moved to Princeton about a year back, it's actually only nine months. So it's, I'm, I'm really glad to be part of this community and have the chance of sharing the work I do in my research to community action like this. So um, I'm gonna to talk today about your food in an urban context. And uh, I wanna begin by first of all, thanking my colleagues. Um, so Dana Boyer is a lead food systems researcher in my group. And I have several PhD and master's students who worked with me over the years, whose data I'm gonna share with you and several grants. Um, my lab is called the Sustainable Urban Systems Lab and I invite you to take a look at some of our work. Um, after talking with uh, Christine and, um, and Steve, we decided that we would talk about three things today in my talk. I'll actually talk a little bit first about how do you measure a city's carbon footprint? It's not straightforward, there's many approaches. It's, uh, and where does food fit in that context? And then I'll talk about the most impactful levers for shrinking the food system's carbon footprint. 
And then finally, I'll talk about some recent work we're doing actually on food action planning with the city of Minneapolis on looking at justice, economy, health, environment, and resilience. So let me Anu, quickly... Anu could you put your slide in the presentation view? Ah, OK. Thank you. OK, great. OK, so I'll talk today about the carbon footprint topic first. And uh, just broadly speaking, we could look at carbon footprints of food as part of the key provisioning systems that make any city function. And so in our network, in, in my Sustainable Healthy Cities network, as well as many cities are actually looking at all of these systems together. So buildings, energy, food, green infrastructure and public spaces, mobility, water and waste, and looking at them together and their interactions. And uh, you can also see some of this at our website, the Sustainable Healthy Cities Network. Um, cities are also looking at uh, food systems and these other systems in the context of multiple outcomes. And Steve already alluded to that, well-being, health, environment, equity, and livability. And how do we look at these in terms of co-benefits and trade-offs? And so that's essentially these things come together when we think about a carbon footprint, which is the environmental impact. We're looking at how do you actually assess a carbon footprint for something as complicated as a city? And this is a picture that shows the boundary of a city where you have these provisioning systems. And most of these things are supplied by transboundary supply chains. For example, food comes from outside fuel for your mobility systems come from outside, power is generated often in a larger grid and comes within cities. And so water, you know, very few cities have all the water that they need within their boundary. And so the challenge is how do you do footprinting considering most of your flows come from outside? And so that's what uh, footprinting is. So when you do an environmental footprint or a carbon footprint, you look at what is being used within the city boundary and you try to track where it's coming from. And particularly for global carbon emissions, you track the emissions across the supply chains. So that's the broad approach. And today I'll focus particularly on food, but our research group addresses all of these systems together. So when we think about food and all these systems, there's multiple ways of accounting for them. Um, the original way, and I've spent about 10 years actually working with cities and with different organizations to figure out how to standardize approaches for transboundary greenhouse gas accounting, recognizing you need to look at the life cycle impacts across the supply chain. But who do you assign those impacts to? Who takes responsibility for that? And I started this work with the city of Denver and a lot of this work has now become part of the US community protocol that ICLEI has released and that several cities are using. So let me just briefly touch upon this before we get into food itself. And so this is the transboundary challenge. If you think about a city um, or an urban region which has buildings, vehicles, industries, these scope one emissions are the direct emissions from fossil fuel combustion, so CO2, maybe methane, if you have any methane emissions leaking or methane coming from waste treatment. But the challenge is that many of our activities are regional. Many of us commute to come to Princeton to work or we commute out to shop, um, we fly, we have freight bringing us goods and services. And even some of our most essential provisioning systems, they're often imported. We import electricity, gasoline, water, food, and even cement and construction materials for the built environment that, that exists around us. And so these are the ways that you, how do you count the life cycle impact of all of these things? It turns out there's four approaches or four attributions that have come up in the literature. And I share that in the next slide. The four broad approaches, the first one is purely territorial. You draw a boundary, around an administrative boundary and you say, I'll only look at emissions within this boundary. Obviously that has shortcomings. It doesn't really work for cities. 
because cities are so small, most of what we need comes from outside. So it's really not a good plan for cities. The second approach is a set of two um, variations of this approach, which is a community-wide approach in one, the very simple one, you only consider electricity and the emissions from power generation imported to your community. In the second approach, you look at all these seven provisioning systems that are essential for every city. And this is called community-wide infrastructure footprint analysis. It's very consistent with the global protocol for cities, basic plus, and uh, it's consistent with ICLEI's approach and the advantage of this is that you begin to consider life cycle emissions, but not only for households, that's the key difference. You also look at life cycle emissions for all the businesses. So for example, here Princeton University is a large, is a large economic activity. Um, not every resident in Princeton is working at Princeton University. And so the university or any of these businesses that export services like educational services, to other, other people outside the boundary, the community-wide approach takes care of that. So not only would we be considering food that each of us eat in our households, we would also be considering food in offices, food at the Princeton cafeterias, at the dormitories. And so it takes a community-wide approach, which is really essential for doing things like low carbon uh, transition planning, resilience planning, because all of that community-wide planning has to take homes, businesses, and industries together. And so this community-wide approach takes care of these key provisioning systems in a community-wide approach. And the value added is that it supports community and urban planning, because urban infrastructure is never planned only for households. We always plan infrastructure for homes, businesses, industry, and government all together. And so this second approach is really valuable for that. The third approach is, which is what I saw is a consumption-based approach, which looks at the life cycle emissions of all goods and services used by final consumers, which are mostly households and government, but it excludes those producers that export goods and services as well as visitors. If you have a lot of visitors coming into Princeton, this consumption based would only count the emissions of the residents of Princeton. But this is really valuable to inform household behaviors. How do you inform household and government purchasing? On the other hand, the operations of businesses and industries that export goods are excluded. So the real value added is that you're informing households. And there's a last type of footprint, which is called the total footprint, which measures all the supply chains including to producers and consumers. It's the community full footprint. It's very challenging to create because the economic input output data that are often needed to create these footprints are, have large uncertainties as you get smaller in your administrative boundary and the added value is really to inform industries. And so as we think about how we're measuring our emissions, it's useful to reflect uh, Consumption-based would tell households how they can reduce their impact. Often for city planning, they use community-wide approaches covering those seven sectors because they're so intimately connected with each other. So I'll just stop you know, this topic here. We can come back to it um, and say that uh, and show you how a typical community-wide footprint looks like for the case of Denver as an example. And so a community-fied GHG emission footprint for infrastructure and food provisioning in Denver combines all the material and energy flows needed to provide buildings, mobility, energy, water, wastewater treatment, waste management, green infrastructure, food, um, and looks at it across the life cycle, transboundary, and puts it all together. This is a glimpse of what Denver's footprint looks like. The hatched areas are showing you emissions that are produced outside that are necessary for Denver's community-wide systems to function. And uh, the, the unhatched areas are emissions that are coming directly within our boundary. And you can see how much is coming outside, quote unquote, to support our activities, homes, businesses, and industries within the city. You could also see for the case of Denver, the blue is buildings-related emissions electricity and natural gas. 
The orange hues are all travel related emissions, cars, trucks, commercial vehicles. This is airline travel, which is transboundary, of course. This is fuel processing. These are the emissions from producing the gasoline, jet fuel, and diesel that's used for our mobility needs. This is the emissions from cement production for our construction. And these are the emissions from food. And you can see it's a substantial portion. For Denver, it's about 13%. There have been surveys of multiple cities. Uh, and then here you see waste, wastewater, and freight. So it gives you a sense of where food is in the scope of everything else when you take a community-wide approach. Um, so I'm going to move on to talk about what are the most impactful urban levels for shrinking the food system's carbon footprint. So hopefully you got a sense of the different footprinting approaches, where food lies in the context of all the other urban services, urban systems, and what strategies you can use um, to reduce the food system's carbon footprint. So before I get into data sharing, I just want to highlight what the food system is about, right? So here's this big old food system, starting from the consumer in the city to the business in the city, like the university cafeteria, and you have this big agricultural system and you have supply chains, and food has impacts on everything, water, land, you know, Steve already showed this, greenhouse gases, social justice and equity and health. So what is the role of the city in shaping that? And I wanted to give us background as rising interest in urban food. So ICLE, which is Local Governments for Sustainability, has a Resilient Urban Food Systems Forum. The United Nations FAO has Food for Cities program. And several cities, um, more than 400, have signed on to the Milan Urban Food Pact, which is looking at all of these things, health, nutrition, equity, environment, supply risks, economy together. And that is the basis for forming food action plans. And today I'm only going to talk about greenhouse gases. Uh, but as we think about food action planning, we could think about the intersection of food with all of these aspects, which is what I'll touch upon talking about food action planning at the end of my talk. So as we think just about the food system, this question of what can you do, particularly in terms of carbon, I wanted to just have three takeaways. And the first takeaway, we talk a lot about local food and local agriculture. And one of the big takeaways from my research group is that there's already substantial agricultural food production happening around US metropolitan areas. So that urban areas could, if we aligned our supply chain, we could be fairly self-reliant, and I'll show you some results in supporting urban demand. But what it is, is that our supply chains are not aligned right now. We ship things long distances. We're not really shortening or connecting local production with local demand in, in, in a very large way. But there is a lot of production already going on. So this raises the question, you know, what is the societal benefit of urban agriculture? If we're practicing more urban gardening within urban boundaries, it's really not necessarily to increase food production by mass, by quantity, but really those multiple other benefits, that's what is really beneficial when we think about local food, local agriculture particularly. And some of those benefits might be subjective well-being, heat and flood mitigation, which we also talked about that could enhance resilience. And so when we think about the food system, it's not always about food per se, but these other core benefits. And then with respect to community-wide carbon emission footprints, one of Many of our studies have shown that it's really diet change and food waste management, that those are by far and above the biggest levels. So if you really want to shrink the carbon footprint, those are the two strategies. And that's why we have the two speakers uh, so that together we address these topics. So just to give you some data to support some of what I'm saying here, if you look at, we looked at agri-food production around all of the 377 metropolitan areas in the US. This is food production going on today from the USDA's agricultural census. You get a glimpse of our metropolitan areas. We looked at 
dairy and milk products. We looked at eggs, we looked at vegetables, we looked at fruits. And the green shows um, MSAs, these are metropolitan statistical areas that are big exporters. And then you can look at the orange and red that are importing at different levels. What was really interesting though for us is that if you looked at just the food, the MSA boundary and you looked at uh, different distances outside, a 25 mile radius, a 50 mile radius, a 75 mile radius, depending on how you define local, there's, there's many definitions of local, you could actually see that even within the boundary of MSAs, about 10 to 20% of MSAs were already self-sufficient. So this is the percentage of self-sufficient metropolitan areas. And as you go out 25 miles around the metropolitan area, the self-sufficiency, the potential for self-sufficiency, even with current production, increases remarkably. And so the big idea is there's a lot of food production happening around us. In fact, you know, 20, 40, 50, and 70% of all US metro areas could be self-sufficient in fruits, vegetables, dairy, and eggs today. This is just a gross analysis in terms of quantity produced versus quantity demanded uh, within a hundred mile radius if we were to align supply and demand. And this calculation included what we call embedded food. So it included not just tomatoes eaten as fresh tomatoes, but also tomatoes in pasta sauce, tomatoes in processed food. It included milk, not just as fluid milk that we drink, but also milk in ice cream, milk in yogurt. So all of that milk demand can be substantially supported in many of our MSAs. And this is something People didn't quite think. We always talk about increasing urban agriculture, but it's really not the quantity of food, but those core benefits that it provides. So that's the big takeaway, that if we want to enhance local uh, regional supply, its production is not the limitation. So why we want to increase local agriculture and the types of local agriculture is, is actually the key question. And uh, there's a wonderful article, if you haven't read this in, uh, in Vox, which talks about the real value of urban farming. And it says, hint, it's not about food production as such. It's not always the food, but it's all these other co-benefits. And I thought I would just share a recent paper from my group that got a lot of attention. We actually studied well-being. So you see here, a lot of interest in food is because of the community it builds, the, the subjective well-being or happiness that people report while they're farming, whether in community gardens or in your backyard. And so we had a recent study that looked at dynamic well-being data reported during daily activities, including household gardening. So it was one of the first studies to look at how happy people feel when they garden in their own uh, backyards. And the big takeaways was um, gardening, this, this was the first study to even identify how many people garden in our sample in Minneapolis, about 30% were gardening. And gardening was actually among the top five activities. It ranked after leisure, other leisure activities, it was statistically similar to biking and walking. And I raised this because a lot of cities do a lot of investment in bicycle paths and walking paths, but they don't really think about gardening because this sort of data didn't exist. And what we're showing here is gardening was similar to some of these other activities that cities are investing for livability. And so what you're seeing here is uh, just how, these, how gardening compares with other activities. It's not, statistically, it's not statistically different from walking and biking and even eating out. It is different from other leisure. And then of course it's, Gardening is much better than sitting in your car and some of these other activities. So it just gives you a feeling for what are the activities that contribute to happiness or emotional well-being in cities and that gardening is up there. And those would be reasons when we talk about justice and equity, we found other important findings that gardening, household gardening was the only activity where women and low income participants reported higher emotional well-being. So as we think about equity, we want to think about where we have nutrition 
lack of access to good nutrition and look at gardening in terms of well-being and employment and other types of benefits. So I'm going to move on to say that this is the type of work we're doing with cities. How do we think of spatially planning your farms, not just for food production, but for some of these broader benefits? So moving on specifically to carbon, since that's the topic of the talk, um, we had uh, studied several cities and looking at what is the contribution of city actions towards the overall food system's environmental impact. So can we look at water, greenhouse gas, and land impacts with different scenarios? And this, this, the next slide is a bit complex, so don't pay attention to the graphics, but the big idea here is we were able to compare two cities in India, Delhi and Pondicherry, with New York and Minneapolis. And we looked at different things like diet change, we looked at urban agriculture, we looked at city food preparation, meaning can you cook with cleaner fuels, we looked at waste management, and we looked at this transboundary reference scenario. If you reduced food waste upstream, that food waste is significant, particularly in India, the food waste upstream is much less in the US, but if you were to compare what cities can do with what can be done upstream, the big takeaway, you can just look, going this way is better, going towards your left reduces impacts, and you can quickly see that diet change has the biggest impact, much more so in US cities than Indian cities because we have a much greater share of meat in our diet. And the next thing after diet change is, is food waste management and how we manage food within our city is comparable or even more in impact compared to reducing food waste in the supply chain. So those are my big takeaways that I gave you the context of where food lies in a community's footprint. Um, we, we talk a lot about urban agriculture, but there are the core benefits of urban agriculture are really key rather than the mass of food produced, it's what you do with that urban agriculture, the local agriculture, and that if you were to shrink the food, food footprint for your, for your dinner plate, literally changing diet and looking at waste, um, household post-consumer waste is really big. What you do with the waste, how you treat it, can you minimize the waste, and those are strategies I think the following speakers will talk about. And so with that, I just want to say that we are working with different cities on food action plans for economy, health, resilience, justice. Um, in particular, we've uh, had the privilege of working with Minneapolis on this. Uh, I used to be at the University of Minnesota before moving here to Princeton, and I really appreciated the minute of silence that, that we had at the beginning of this, of this webinar. I'm sure folks in Minneapolis appreciate it as well. Um, but here, uh, we started an 18 month process last year in April. Um, this is the Minneapolis's Food Action Plan's goal statement. The city of Minneapolis is developing a roadmap for a more equitable, climate resilient, just and sustainable local food system and local food economy. And uh, they want to develop this plan aligning with the Milan Food Pact. And it's a very community oriented approach and I'd love to talk more about it uh, after this talk or uh, during this talk. And I want to thank you all for, uh, for listening. Thanks. So I can stop sharing. Okay. Can everyone hear me okay? So Anu, thank you very much um, for that excellent presentation. It's really provocative. And I just wanna remind all of the attendees that you can ask your questions uh, in the Q&A button in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. You can do this throughout the, uh, the course of the, the event. So please uh, enter your questions, we will have plenty of time for some Q&A and lively discussion on uh, Anu's talk and some of the great points that she brought out over the last few minutes. 
So now let's turn to um, what we eat and how we make those choices. And it's uh, my pleasure to introduce Karina Pierce-Lamalfa. As you can see here, uh, Karina is a national board certified health and wellness coach, a member of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, and a co-founder of Princeton Eats Plants, which is a local group that builds community for many people interested in relationships among food and environment and health. Uh, Karina has a long experience. Uh, she's developed uh, school curricula around, around this topic, and she's worked uh, over a decade with individuals and groups to create wellness plans to optimize key health indicators, support mental and physical well being that we heard a lot about from Anu. Um, and to empower sus sustainable change uh, and its impact on the environment. So over to you, Karina. Thank you, Steve. What a pleasure to be here. Um, before I begin, I'd like to remind everyone that we're going to be talking about some potential dietary changes that you may be interested in making. And before you do that, please check with your personal healthcare professional. So what I'd like to talk about tonight is making some simple changes to lower your carbon footprint through food. Um, and we'll be talking about adding foods that are good for the environment, uh, also good for your wallet and have some additional health benefits. So uh, the way I'd like to lay it out is we'll talk first about some steps that I have uh, walked clients through and that have worked for them when making difficult behavior changes. Um, we'll also touch upon several of the challenges that most people face when making uh, changes like this. We'll give a nod to this very unique time um, and some of the benefits and possible challenges of making changes during this time. And then I'd like to leave you with some resources to get you started on your way. So next slide, please. So we're calling this the art of sustainable eating. And what we're really saying is there are going to be three simple ways or general areas where you can make changes to more plant forward eating. So we're not saying you need to eat all plants, although some people may choose to do that. Um, for most here tonight, probably adding and um, adding foods that they're comfortable with little by little over time, that might be a better way to do it. So in terms of the art of sustainable eating, we're going to talk about our three methods to add, replace, and transform. And there's no real secret here. The foods we're going to add are going to be fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, legumes, root vegetables. Um, they're naturally high in fiber. Uh, they keep you very full. So it turns out to be economical and very efficient. And they also help create lower rates of greenhouse gas emissions. Next slide, please. So first, our first action word is add. And in this, we're talking about really doing this each day, consciously and intentionally bulking up your meals, um, either with individual ingredients, like I'll describe in a moment, or by adding a salad, steamed vegetables, sauteed vegetables, corn on the cob, things like that to your normal, possibly meat heavier meals. So what I've seen work for people is taking a recipe, perhaps a favorite chili recipe and adding extra vegetables, uh, peppers, corn, green beans, anything that you would like beyond the normal garlic and onions. Um, and little by little, you could be training your family uh, to to accept more vegetables uh, as part of their meal. You're also lowering the cost of the dish most likely, and uh, you're improving its nutritional value as well. Regarding breakfast, uh, we've had many people add walnuts and berries to their oatmeal. Um, and one of my favorite things, especially in the winter, is to add greens. Um, in the summer, escarole for sure, but in the winter, perhaps uh, baby spinach. Um, and you're just going to be adding those to your favorite soup. They have a very little, very mild flavor and will most likely be palatable for lots of different, uh, lots of different eaters. And the photo here is a mac and cheese and somewhere in there, there's 
there's good healthy pasta providing a lot of energy, but we've also got some good broccoli in there too. So let's go to our next action word, the next slide, please. So in terms of replacing, we're saying maybe one meal a week, you might want to replace your normal animal foods, especially beef, lamb, and veal uh, with something, with a food that is just lighter on the environment. So maybe you would start with one meal per week. Maybe you are already doing that and you'd like to move to three or four meals a week. Um, this is a great opportunity to get teenagers who might be sheltering at home with you involved in some really fun kitchen cooking. And many of them may be interested in doing this uh, for the environment and for their health as well. So some examples of this would be uh, you know, taking your regular daily smoothie and using soy milk or oat milk in there. Um, again, we'll talk about chili, one of my family's favorites. We're going to remove the beef this time instead of just trying to squeeze it out in, in the ad slide. So this time we're swapping it out and we're going to replace it with either lentils or possibly uh, plant-based crumbles. And then also when we go out, possibly to a barbecue or some kind of a meetup with neighbors, um, you would be able to bring veggie sausages or veggie hot dogs or veggie burgers with you and always bring a few extra because you'll find that many people want to give it a try. So we're living in a great time for this. Um, these alternative foods, whether it's dairy-free cheeses, meat alternatives, uh, recipes for re using mushrooms in place of beef, they've never been more widely available or better tasting. Um, if anyone remembers early dairy-free cheeses from 10 years ago, uh, even five years ago, wow, it's really changed. So much more palatable, very good texture, Let's move to the next action word, which is transform. So this section really is a nod to how much we're cooking at home and uh, how people have reported to me that they're really very satisfied cooking at home, sharing foods uh, with neighbors and friends where possible. And I'm thinking that some of this behavioral change really may stick. Um, it's easier to keep to your health goals and your environmental goals when you're controlling the food right in your own kitchen. So it's very, before I go through the examples, I just want to touch briefly on the importance of cultural tradition. So food is very, very important to us. Uh, we have a culture of food uh, in the United States in general, what food means to us, what our expectations are, and then within each household unit, there are additional traditions and there's a, a strong emotional component for us to food. Not only our traditions, but holiday foods, uh, what we feel we need to make to show love and care for those that we cook for. So what I'm suggesting here is that we remake some family favorites. Let's look at some examples of that. I've had a lot of success teaching people to make a tofu scramble for a holiday brunch, um, replacing eggs and milk um, with, uh, with some foods that are even lower on the carbon emission scale. Um, one of the things I do for the holidays is I replicate my grandmother's lasagna, but I make it with a cashew cheese um, and I put a lot of vegetables in it and people have come to expect it and look forward to it and hope to take leftovers home. So also um, other cultural favorites in my household would be meatballs or a lentil loaf. Um, and that can easily be made from lentils or mushrooms. So you could easily replace that as a family meal. In terms of enchiladas and tacos and foods in that area, um, I've been able to teach people to use either almonds or um, sunflower seeds even to make a crema sauce that can be used in Mexican cooking or South American dishes. Um, and then again, we've got plant-based chicken strips of all different kinds available in all different stores. So now is the time to give those a try and find one that you like. So I'd say for my family, what made us successful in 2004, when we switched over to a plant forward way of eating, um, we found four or five 
different dishes that were our go-to. So chili, you've heard me say two times already. So chili, that was a big hit for sure uh, with the side of rice and a big salad, the tofu scramble, uh, tofu cubes, obviously lasagna, baked ziti, things like that, meatloaf, meatballs, uh, swapping out wraps and sandwiches with pl plant-based cheeses, and then learning how to really feed a crowd. So the great thing about spending a little bit less money on your food is that it's very easy to multiply it and bring it to a community dinner. For example, our Princeton Eats Plants dinners, we have our monthly potlucks. And uh, I know that we're all able to be really generous with what we're bringing in because we're really using lower cost food items. So I'm ready for the next slide. So what seems to be common in, with, all, with all the people that I've been working with is that there are some recurring challenges and hurdles that people need to, uh, need to tackle when they're interested in making a change like this. So number one, you're here tonight and that is fantastic. I'm sure you've already had some education in terms of uh, ways to lower your carbon footprint regarding diet. Um, but thank you for joining this where we're able to dive, dive into it just a little bit more deeply. So usually one of the first questions or concerns for people is, will this way of eating be more expensive? And uh, honestly, from everything I've seen, grains, potatoes, beans, greens, bananas are some of the healthiest and the least expensive foods at your supermarket. So Possibly in the beginning, when people get started, they may be buying more spices, they may pick up um, a new gadget in the kitchen, but usually they're really noticing right away that the amount of money that they're spending um, and, and sometimes the amount of time spent shopping has really, really reduced. So a next big concern is will the food still taste good? And um, to this, I usually say um, most of our flavor comes from our spices, our cooking methods, uh, sauteing garlic and oil or a mirepoix of carrots, celery and onions um, all together. That's where we're really developing our flavor. Even when we're working with meats like beef, lamb or veal, usually on their own, they don't taste very good. It's actually the spices, the spice blends and the cooking methods that make it really great. So I would say that you will probably find that you'll add more spices, more fresh spices. And in doing so, you'll probably find your food to be lighter and more delicious. And our palates really do change. So as we lighten up our foods, most people report within two weeks or just a bit later, that their, their tastes have changed and they prefer the lighter foods and most definitely they prefer the boost in energy that comes from them. Um, so I'm ready for the next slide. So the, here's a great question. Why act now? I mean, we already have made so many behavioral changes in the past couple of months that this kind of a lean in just might feel less big. So many of us are cooking at home, reporting great satisfaction with that. As I mentioned earlier, we may be sharing food, uh, cooking for relatives or parents and dropping it off because they can't go out to get their own. Um, we may be buying in bulk or at least becoming aware of how to get things online. So we have already made a good dent in the behavioral change necessary to get this off the ground for the environment. So we do, we have been looking carefully, I think as a whole at where our food comes from. And honestly, clean food from plants for me beats food from animal products any day. So um, we're looking for additional uh, recreational items like Dr. Ramaswamy mentioned, and people may be interested in growing their own garden or their deck boxes. It's a great sensory activity for kids to keep them busy for the summer. And um, we'll be moving and being outside and working in community, which has many, many benefits. Uh, I mentioned earlier, finding delicious meat replacements or cheese replacements could certainly become a family or a group of friends, uh, could become a mission to find the ones that you like 
and trade around the ones that you're tasting so that everyone can get a chance to figure out which alternatives they really prefer. And there has been uh, some good research on how eating in a more plant forward way can boost your mental health, your perception of happiness, and your sense of well being. It also will give us a better connection to nature and it lowers stress. So, so big, big co benefits. Finding community connection through community gardens, of course, that would be great. We're already connecting in new ways. Um, if anyone had told me we would be YouTubing on so many, YouTubing and Zooming, I don't even know if those are verbs, on so many great topics every day, uh, you know, in just these few months, I don't know if I would have believed it. But I have people working in cohorts to work to free to cook foods, to create meals, to freeze them, to have them as grab and go when things get busier again. So all of these things, fortunately, also have the benefit of creating better health outcomes as a side effect and lowering the rates of many of our major diseases in addition to reducing our carbon emissions. So I'm ready for the next slide. We wanted to give you some key resources to get you on your way. And these are some of the resources we give out at Princeton Eats Plants, our community group, and we wanted to just help you get started. Um, so in terms of movies and documentaries, Steve mentioned the very powerful movie recently out called Game Changers. Um, what a great watch. And these, this move, film as well as Plant Pure Nation are both free on Netflix right now. If you'd like an online group to start with, uh, Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine has a free kickstart and the Plant Pure community uh, begun by Dr. T. Colin Campbell also has a free global jumpstart. And I've got the links here for you uh, to take a look at. So it's helpful anytime you're making a behavioral change to build your tribe, create a lot of supportive people around you to help you make the changes you've defined that you'd like to make. And uh, you'll find groups like this on Meetup, uh, definitely on Facebook, um, and also Prince Need Plants is on both of those. So next slide, please. So a few more resources in case you want more information on how this will ne not necessarily be more expensive. Um, we have an article here for you, um, how to eat a healthy plant-based diet on $50 per week per person. Um, other resources for getting involved with healthy school programs or for kids is uh, this resource here from Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. If you have individual questions about how you can get your protein, um, we know that the average American gets about twice the amount of protein that is actually needed. And even vegetarians come in pretty high on the protein amounts, but we have a good amount of information there for you with that handout and then just something else for affordable, affordable healthy eating as well that also helps the environment. So hopefully I've covered just a few areas, um, some simple changes, behavioral change is not easy. So find people, get educated, take the steps slowly or quickly, whichever works for you. Um, continue to learn more and hopefully we'll all thrive and grow through this unique time resulting in feeling more empowered to whether there's actually something that we can do to lower our greenhouse emissions while connecting to nature and eating in a more healthy way. So thank you very much. My pleasure to be here. That's great. Thanks, thanks, Karina. Um, I don't know about anyone else, but I started to get very hungry looking at many of those pictures during your presentation. And I suspect I'll find something in my refrigerator that will be very compliant and environmental, environmentally friendly after, after this session. So it's uh, my pleasure to uh, introduce our last speaker. Uh, Sarah Alnikib is an assistant professor at the Rutgers Cooperative Extension, the Department of Family and Community Health Services. Sarah has focused on food insecurity and improving food access uh, over the past several years. And she's also very interested in food waste in institutional settings and how behavioral economics can be leveraged to reduce food waste. 
Sarah? Yeah, thank you so much, Steve. I'm really excited to be here and thank you for the people who stayed on. I know it's been a long presentation, so I appreciate that. Um, so today I'm gonna to talk about uh, practical ways to reduce food waste at home, but I'm going to start by talking a little bit about food waste, so next slide. Um, so in sustainability, we have this concept of uh, the triple bottom line. We want to make sure that any uh, sustainable system, you know, works on an economic level, social level, and environmental level. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about how food waste is kind of affecting all of these systems. Uh, next slide. So in an economic uh, level, we waste about 30 to 40 percent of the food we uh, grow here in the United States. Uh, additionally, in 2010, uh, the USDA um, said that we're, we wasted about $161 billion in food on the retail level, and um, we spend about $2 billion just putting it in a landfill, transporting it, and, and paying for the labor. And so that's a lot of, uh, that's a huge economic cost that is related to food waste. Additionally, uh, there's um, the resources that go into the land, water, labor, and energy, and all of those other inputs that go into processing and producing that food. Next slide. Um, and we also know that it has a huge environmental impact. So uh, like uh, Professor Anu said, you know, uh, the, there's these uh, greenhouse gases that are produced not only from transporting that food, but producing that food, the pesticides that are used to grow that food. Um, and so uh, the pro Project Drawdown, which is a nonprofit that looks at, um, you know, a, a climate change and how to mitigate climate change, found that the number one way to uh, stop, um, you know, global warming by about two degrees was actually um, reducing food waste. And so food waste is a definitely one of those biggest ways we can uh, work to reduce food waste. I mean, to reduce uh, greenhouse gas, gas emissions. Next slide. Um, and it's also um, kind of a juxtaposition with how our life is right now. We know that, you know, um, from an ethic ethics of eating um, kind of idea, we see that there's a lot of people who are food insecure, you know, one in nine Americans don't know where their next meal is coming from. And that means 11 million kids in the United States. And yet we have a food, this large food waste issue. And we see that this is uh, because of uh, the vulnerability in our food system. I don't know if um, any of you were looking at the headlines. Um, due to COVID-19, there was a lot of food waste at the farms. There was, um, you know, ranchers of you know spilling you know farmers spilling out milk and and ranchers kind of not um slaughtering their animals and and yet we had people in urban areas unable to get food and so this lack of redundancy in the system creates real vulnerabilities in our food system and so when something like hurricane sandy comes along or a um you know issue like covid19 where it disrupts the food system we have a real issue and so this is some of the social costs that comes along with food waste. Next slide, please. Um, and so it's just important to talk a little bit about what is food waste versus food loss. Um, and just in general, food loss generally happens upstream, meaning more at the farm or in the processing plant. And food uh, waste happens downstream when the consumer gets it. So at the retail level, think about the grocery store or, or the restaurant or at home. And so um, next slide, there are different ways to think about food waste. Uh, you can also think about it from a waste centered approach, which really looks at it, uh, reducing food loss for environmental purposes. And um, you, know, you can also think about it from a, a food centered approach, meaning we think about food waste, um, you know, we allow for some food waste for um, parts of the plant that we don't eat, un unedible portions of the plant or for food safety issues. And so um, you want, you know, some the, um, organizations define food waste differently. And so when you're looking at food waste data, this is one of the reasons you find uh, different data. Next slide, please. So um, where does food waste happen in the United States? You can see that most of the food waste happens at the consumer level. 
So we're just kind of giving an example of, of the fate of 100 apples. And we could see that, you know, at the farm we, we or the orchard, we waste about 20 apples. But, um, and in processing and packaging, we're only wasting about four apples. But most of the waste happens at that grocery store level and at that consumer level where we're at home. And so we only end up with 36 of our 100 apples. And most of those uh, wasted apples happened kind of in that grocery store and that consumer level. Next slide. Um, and so uh, this is kind of an example of what Anu was talking about, where in underdeveloped countries, you see that most of the food waste happens, you know, at that production or that post harvest or storage and handling because of cold chain. Um, processing, right? So um, in the United States, we've done a really great job of making sure that, you know, we have um, this cold chain for a lot of those perishable items, right? So fruits, vegetables, seafood, things like that, where most of, um, you know, most of the time we divert it and make sure that um, there isn't too much food and uh, food um, safety issues. But um, you can also see that um, uh, most of the food waste happens at this consumer level, which is at home, at the supermarket, restaurant, and schools, and, and other big uh, food service institutions like hospitals and prisons. Um, and most of it, uh, most of the food waste that occurs by category are things like seafood or fruits and vegetables, because those are the more perishable items. And um, you know, companies have developed ways to use some of those byproducts of food. So think about you know broccoli and florets, and if you buy the florets, then they use the stems for something else, um, or um, you know, potatoes, the potatoes that don't make it for french fries, they use it to make potato starch and things like that. Um, next slide, please. Um, and this, these next two slides are really just talking about how um, not all food waste is created equal. Um, we know that, you know, water use and energy use uh, differs based on what um, we waste or what we throw out. And so obviously things that are high in protein, um, they use a lot more water, protein in general needs more water to form and to break down. So even when you're eating a diet with high protein, you need to make sure you drink a little bit extra water. And so um, you can see here that, you know, you know, beef, obviously pork are one of some of the highest um, producers of uh, the need, or need for um, more water. And then next slide. And they're also the one, some of the highest producers for um, greenhouse gases. And so um, these were slides that we have taken from uh, Menus of Change conference uh, that's by the Culinary Institute and uh, Harvard School of Public Health. And they provide a, a good example of how um, different foods have different impacts on the environment. Next slide. So wasting food um, is not just wasting food, right? It wastes everything. So it wastes the water, the land, the energy, labor, money, and of course the law that the farmers put into their work. And so we need to be careful and try to waste less food. Next slide. So what do we do? How do we reduce food waste? Um, the um, EPA created this food recovery hierarchy, which tries to explain how best to reduce food waste. And so it discusses things like reducing food waste at the source, making sure that we don't make too much or produce more food than we can um, handle. And if we can't do that, we want to feed hungry people. If we can't do that, we want to feed animals. And if we can't do that, then we want to use it for industrial uses or um, compost it. And then finally, it ends up in a landfill. Unfortunately, the food system that we live in is an inverted version of this pyramid. We um, throw everything out. And if we do anything about it, we compost it. And even though that's, uh, composting is great, it brings back the nutrition into the soil, all of the calories in that food are lost during the compost process, right? That heat that emerges, or if you're using vermicompost, the, the, the um, worms are eating um, some of that um, nutrition, and so they're kind of wasting some of that. So um, that's one of the reasons why we want to use more upstream um, sources. Next slide. Um, so some of the potential um, reasons why people waste so much food at home are because uh, a lot of people don't know that food waste is a big issue in the United States. You know, it's not something that we consider a lot. Also, there's a huge um, 
confusion, a lot of confusion around date labels. We know that people don't understand date labels, they misinterpret them. And um, actually, um, Harvard um, Food Policy uh, Institute for Food Policy has a great um, a report called The Dating Game that talks about how date labels have impacted um, some of our um, use, have impacted our food waste. And then um, other things are like storing or impulse buying. And so some of the things that we can do, there are definitely policy level um, levers that we can use. So things like simplifying date labels, which we'll talk about educating uh, for better food management. So that's what we're doing today. That's why I wanted to highlight that as well as um, kind of infrastructure for uh, composting on a large, on a large scale. And then on an individual level, we can definitely plan our meals better, understand date labels and um, prepare, um, you know, the right amount of food and freeze any food. So we'll talk a little bit about some of these things. Next slide. So the first thing um, you can do today to help improve um, your food waste is to plan better. Um, meal planning does not only help you reduce uh, food waste, but it also helps you notice any nutritional gaps in your um, system. So, for example, when I was in graduate school and, you know, I had two young children and I was working two jobs, I was very, very busy. And so I didn't notice, but I was making like pasta every night of the week because it was just the most convenient thing. I just throw, you know some water in the stove and you put the box of pasta in there and I was done. Um, but obviously after, you know, stepping back and starting to meal plan, I realized that that was, you know, there was a lot of nutritional gaps in my, my diet and my kids diet and that we were missing a lot of nutrients. And so um, planning the meals not, you know, will allow you to kind of, you know, very cold and calm state, think about all of the things that you can do to help um, reduce food waste and improve the diet for your family. Next slide. Other things you can do is um, obviously shop um, a little bit better. So one thing that you know meal planning helps with is making sure that um, you have a good list of items that you're going to need to buy. We also recommend that you buy smaller items for the, those those things that expire more quickly. So. I'll give you an example. I have a four-year-old daughter who loves strawberries. And so we used to buy a lot of strawberries to make, you know, make sure we have them on hand and most of them were fresh. And it was very difficult because, you know, inevitably some of the strawberries would go bad and we'd have to throw them out. And so what we started doing is we'd buy half of our strawberries fresh and half of it frozen so that we'd have strawberries on hand if she, you know, really, really needs to have them. But uh, we knew that at least um, they, they wouldn't go to waste and we wouldn't throw them out. Next slide. Um, and then finally, proper storage is key. It's one of the most important things you can do because um, one of the ways we end up wasting so much is we don't notice food that, to, that goes bad. So one thing is to look at your cupboards and your fridge and make sure that you have all of the older items or older food in the front. Um, also, when you purchase new items, have a first in first out system. So it's called FIFO for those in food service, but basically you put the older food in the front and the newer food in the back or um, so that you're using the older food first. Also in our fridge, we have a eat first section. So this is for leftovers. When we have multiple leftovers, you have you know what, what the oldest leftover is. Um, and then we eat that before we eat the other leftovers. Um, and then some things are, you know, you can store, uh, you can uh, freeze food to store it for a longer period of time. So if I see something that has kind of a expiration date coming up and I know I can't use it in time, I store, I just freeze it and I know that it lasts a lot longer. Next slide. And you also want to make sure that you're storing food properly. And so that means that you're um, making sure that your fridge is um, your freezer and your fridge are at the right temperature. So about um, zero degrees Fahrenheit for uh, your freezer and about 35 degrees um, Fahrenheit for your fridge. And you also wanna look at foods that emit eth ethylene gas versus those that don't. And I will give you some resources for that. Next slide. And then um, one of the things that I discussed was date labels. A lot of people don't understand what date labels mean. Um, most of the time they think it means an expiration date, meaning the food is not safe after you eat it. 
<clears throat> but most state labels are actually <clears throat> discuss quality of the food, not food safety. So sell by dates are really for, between, um, for the food producer to tell the manufacturer that the um, food will be the most stable, shelf stable food will be like at best quality by selling it at this date. It has nothing to do with um, the actual food safety. Same thing with best buy and use by dates. Most of them mean that they're at peak quality at that time and that they're not, uh, it's not an indication of food safety. And I'll definitely give you some resources um, that will explain them better. Next slide. Um, and then finally, you want to make sure that if you, you know, use it and don't lose it. So if you can, you know, you know, love your leftovers, make sure that you're using them in new recipes if you can. Um, offer your friends and family, you know, extra leftovers, um, donate anything that's unopened or non-perishable. Um, and encourage your guests to take some uh, leftovers. And of course, learn um, how to preserve food, especially if you have a garden and you're trying to make sure that um, you're preserving some of the outputs of that. So we actually have in our department, a master food preserver course, if you're interested, um, that teaches people how to pickle and freeze and vermat food. And then um, you also wanna you know, feed animals if you can, and if you can't, then you want to compost and consider a backyard compost. Next slide. So what are some of the next steps? I'm gonna recommend that you take a healthy meal planning presentation that I prepared before. Um, and it's a self-paced presentation. You can take it at your um, own pace and you can go through it. Um, if you're interested, I also think you should clean out your cupboards. I mentioned that that is one of the most important things that you could do. Um, and then finally, uh, download the USDA Food Keeper app. It helps explain when things were, are expected to expire and um, you know how long you can keep certain foods. I also wanted to recommend that we have a Wellness Wednesdays with FCHS um, webinar every Wednesday at 2 p.m. on um, different topics of um, wellness. And so I'll definitely give you that information. Um, I just wanted to thank the, my collaborators um, who have worked with me on these projects, both for food waste in uh, schools. Next slide. And this is my email if you have any questions and I appreciate your time. Thank you, Sarah. That was that was terrific, and I want I want to thank you and all of our speakers for giving us a a wide range of information and uh, practical solutions to how we can each of us be personally empowered to make changes that are going to have impact for our environment with regards to food, from food systems, food consumption and choices, and food waste. So uh, let me remind uh, the audience, we have about uh, hopefully 15 or so minutes for some Q&A. Uh, we have several, but uh, you still have a chance to get in your question if you wanna type it into the Q&A window. And I also want to remind everyone that uh, these slides and particularly the slides on the resources that were provided uh, will be accessible on the Sustainable Princeton website. So if you didn't have a chance to jot down some of those resources uh, that you're interested in, you'll certainly have the ability to do so on the Sustainable Princeton website. So let me, let me kick off uh, the Q&A by uh, asking, um, uh, Corrine, I'm gonna start with you actually, and um, ask you, you gave a lot of great practical solutions, but if you had a pick the most important or the singular advice that you would give someone um, around changing what they eat or how they shop for food, and Sarah, you can answer as well, um, to be more climate friendly. Um, what would be that advice, especially in a difficult family situation where you have a family with different tastes, um, they're juggling all the different demands of family life, and it's not only about eating at home, I guess it's also about eating out, going to restaurants, the same things apply in addition to the, to the shopping and eating at home environment. So what, what, how would you answer that? Or what would be, be the most important advice that you would give? Well, for an adult household, I would say that creating a plan 
um, just as Sarah was mentioning, um, if you can find uh, some attractive uh, entrees in cookbooks, um, I would then turn that into a shopping list um, because you can't begin cooking unless you are ready, as Sarah mentioned, and your kitchen is ready and you have all the ingredients that you need. If you have a family with kids, I would follow the research out of Cornell that the more the kids handle the food and chop the food and are um, around to actually prepare some of the meals, the more likely they are to eat it. And it certainly helps if you can keep the environment light and they can have um, peers. So peer support uh, in a classroom or even at home when friends are allowed back in the homes um, to try some of these new foods or new food activities with your kids and their friends with them actually doing the chopping with safe plastic knives or however you feel that would work best. Those would be my two tips. Sarah, anything to add? No, I think that that's great. I think, um, you know, absolutely. I, I echo, um, you know, what Karina said about having kids involved in the kitchen. I think that is one of the best ways you can um, get kids to change their mind about certain fruits and vegetables. Um, another thing is just be flexible. You know, we're all human. We're all trying to figure this out. And so realize that meal planning and, and you know, all of these things are tools and um, that they're supposed to make life easier. And so if it doesn't work, that's fine. But um, try to try to make um, do do small changes one step at a time for sure. Okay. Anu, I wanted to give you a chance to see if you had any comments about either that question or any of the uh, the, the, the presentations that came after yours, uh, as it related to your research and and uh, things that you uh, you spoke of. I actually thought, uh, you know, the linkages were very clear and Sarah, thank you for, for connecting back and forth. Thank you for doing that. Um, I, I do think, you know, when we think about diet change, um, the other thing beyond households, we could think of offices and school cafeterias and the options of introducing different types of foods through the school district is, is a wonderful one because then kids experience food with their peers. Um, since I came from Minneapolis, I would say that we ended up having our food policy council meetings in the offices of the school district. And I was blown away by the amazing menus. I mean, kids were eating chana masala and, you know, interesting foods that I would never have. I mean, my son never had access to 10 years back you know, when he went to school. So uh, office cafeterias are great places to be thinking. At least you can get one meal a week um, that could be nudged through office cafeteria programs. So Anu, uh, sticking with you, um, you presented the, uh, the greenhouse gas inventory or the findings from the Denver uh, research. And uh, I know there's different methodologies that are used to, you know, by different investigators to determine uh, particular footprints uh, coming from different uh, communities, regions, cities. It seemed like it was quite similar to what I've seen for the Princeton greenhouse gas inventory. And I don't know if you had a chance to look at that in detail, but how about commenting about size of communities or, or regional or the regional variations uh, uh, on right. these communities. Are they all fairly similar in terms of uh, the, the uh, impact? Mm -hmm. on, yeah, that's a great sources? question. So the graphs you showed were consumption-based footprints of households that were calculated using, I think, Berkeley's clean, cool climate calculator. And the community-wide footprint really depends on the ratio of businesses to houses. It depends on the type of businesses. So we've actually looked at classifying cities into different typologies. So you could have a net exporting city um, and you might think about, oh, all those net exporting cities are in China, but that's not true. You could think of Aspen, Colorado as a net exporting city because it's a big tourism town. And so for Aspen, we've actually worked with some of the ski resorts. A bulk of the footprint would be your commercial energy use, residential will be a sliver. And so then they realize, oh, they have to focus on their commercial activities. And that's how 
the community-wide footprint is, is literally like a fingerprint of the combination of residential, industrial, and commercial activities in the city. So each city ends up being itself unique, but the methodology is actually consistent. So the methodology is consistent. And if you took each piece of it, so the way the food systems footprint is calculated is going to be very similar, the method to how you're calculating it for your residences. So the method is standardized, the proportion just depends on the proportion of activities. We've, and we've shown this for multiple cities. So there's value to thinking about looking at the footprint and you'll recognize what type of a community you are. Are you predominantly industrial, predominantly residential, and so on. Right. Okay. So I'm going to turn to some questions from, from uh, the participants. So I, I'm going to stick with you, Anu, in terms of one question that came up around your, um, some of the information you provided about the, uh, the distances from the urban center uh, and the impact that that had. Uh, what about seasonal variation? Um, as, as, you're, as everyone's well aware, fruits and vegetables are not readily accessible locally Mm -hmm. uh, or even within a hundred mile radius to Princeton right. in the dead of winter. Uh, we often get those from Southern states or even Southern continents. Uh, would you comment on, so on that's, how, the, that's why how those you take that two, into account? Yeah, so, so we, in that particular study that I shared, we haven't, but it's a question that we ourselves said that this is just an annual look to look at capacity. It doesn't mean that we can easily readily adjust for the seasonality, but that's why you see that it, uh, it, the veggies and fruits had the lowest number of uh, MSAs that could be self-sufficient because most of those MSAs were the ones in California that, that are growing fruits and veggies year round. So that, that's a good question, uh, but it also speaks to things like milk and cheese it speaks also for eggs, you know, what is the potential to create a smaller uh, local food economy that looks at the processing value chain? Because right now everything is processed in these big industries. And so when you think of shortening those distances, fruits, veggies, are, you know, fruits are probably the hardest to do because of the seasonality and the location, but some of these other crops, other products, you could think of really invigorating the food economy if you wanted to. So there's trade-offs, you know, why would you, and that's exactly our point is that we're not production limited. Uh, where I'm not even suggesting everyone start having a local food shed for everything, but we're showing where we are already is already substantially, uh, there's a substantial amount of production around most MSAs. Okay, great. Uh, Sarah, maybe maybe for you, um, a question from one of the participants. Uh, recent food waste bill, A2371, passed by the assembly and signed by Governor Murphy, requires large generators of food waste to send it to a food waste recycling facility within 25 miles. If I understand correctly, the state currently has only one food waste recycler. How helpful do you expect this legislation to be? Will it create a new industry and new jobs? Any comment on that? Yeah, um, I think that this is a step in the right direction. I think, um, you know, like everyone was mentioning, and I remember Anu was talking about, you know, a city is more than just its residents. It has a lot of businesses. It has, you know, some cities have hospitals. They have um, school, most cities have schools. And so all of those are large food service uh, producers, they have, they produce a lot of food waste as well, right? And so by um, kind of diverting that waste and trying to um, use that waste in more productive ways, you know, that's, I think, where a lot of uh, the potential is. And um, this has been, you know, um, a process. So New Jersey just passed its first ever guidelines for food waste in 2017 with Governor Christie right before he left in August. And um, it created a guideline for New Jersey to reduce food waste by half by 2030. And it actually looked at creating guidelines for schools and higher, institu higher ed institutions on uh, reducing food waste. So I think, you know, for that bill to come out in 2017 and now Governor Murphy in, you know, March 2019, or I mean, uh, 2019, 2020, 
kind of came out with these legislation. I think that this is progress for sure, especially for government, you know. And on top of that, it's, um, you know, in the right direction, absolutely, because we know that individually we make a lot of food waste, but a lot of us before COVID were eating outside of the house, right? And so we need to work on those large institutions that where we eat um, and how to reduce it at that source. Okay. A few questions about nutritional value um, to some of the personal food choices. So maybe I'll shoot these over to Karina, but the other panelists should feel free to weigh in as well. So I'm gonna combine a couple of questions that came across here. Um, one asked about nutritional value of corn. Uh, the others were asking about um, protein uh, value of meat versus lentils and beans. Uh, the uh, whether plant-based foods lack iron compared to red meat um, and how vegetarians or vegans get their iron, sufficient iron for their uh, required daily uh, consumption. And uh, any suggestions about particular brands? I don't want to get into promote any promotional uh, kind of situation, but uh, are there any things that people should look for perhaps on the labels around the, the healthy alternatives that are available in the grocery store. So Karina, maybe you first and okay. open it up to the okay. other panelists. That's a, that's a tall order. I'll, uh, I'll move through those four and I, I, look, I really look forward to the answer, answers from our other panelists as well. Um, so regarding corn, culturally we treat it as a vegetable, but it's truly a grain. So if you put corn nutritionally with its fiber, vitamins, and minerals up against broccoli, it's going to lose. But if you put whole grain corn that you know is hopefully non-GMO um, up against you know something like wheat, it it really holds its own. In one cup, it has 41 grams of carbs for good energy, uh, 5.4 grams of protein. Um, it has 17% of the daily value of vitamin C and almost 20% of the daily value of folate, additional vitamins, minerals, and phytonutrients. So I think there is room for it. Um, uh, the downside, of course, is that in some sensitive people, it can spike your blood sugar. So that's something for you to consider. Um, in terms of fake meats, meat replacements. Um, I like to work with food as close to its source as possible. So, you know, my favorite burger would be like mashed chickpeas, a handful of oats, some onions, uh, some really good spices, mash it all up and bake it. Um, but I know that that's not always possible. So um, there is a, there, there are some burgers on the market that have no additives. Um, um, can I say the name? They're made out of sunflower seeds. All right, it's called the Sunshine Burger. Um, uh, they tend to be very clean, very clean ingredients. Uh, in the hot dog area, yeah, dog is made from vegetables and not a lot of filler. Um, my kids used to really love tofu pups, so. Um, so again, my, you know, A plus is whole, whole grain closest to its source, ones that you make yourself or ones that you find like sunshine burgers. And then, you know, B would be tofu pups, yeah, dog. And then moving on down the, pro, uh, the processed food level, knowing that sometimes you'll just have to try. All right, so uh, the only thing I really wanna say about iron in foods is that it's readily available. Vegetables have uh, non-heme iron uh, and meat has heme iron. And I'll let anyone else who would like to talk about, you know, what they believe to be more absorbable or less absorbable. But um, I found that people between broccoli, spinach, Swiss chard, parsley, wheatgrass, uh, some, you know, lots of seeds, pumpkin, sesame, um, sunflower seeds again, kidney beans, chickpeas, dried apricots, baked potatoes, very good plant-based sources of absorbable iron. Um, okay, I think yeah. I can. And Sarah, do you, Sarah, you're a registered dietitian as I remember, do you have anything to add? No, I think um, Karina did an excellent job. I think, you know, my rule of thumb is don't eat anything that your grandma doesn't recognize as food. So if your grandma doesn't know that that is food, then don't eat it. Um, you know, I think, 
you know, uh, just because it's vegetarian doesn't mean it's healthy. Like Steve, you mentioned Impossible Burger, it's pretty much the same amount of calories, pretty much the same amount of fat. Um, and so it's just because it's, you know, vegan or vegetarian doesn't mean it's healthy. I think we need to be mindful of that. Um, but absolutely, um, you know, humans need about nine amino acids to survive that we get from external sources. And as long as you mix your greens and your uh, lentils and legumes and things like that, um, you'll have a well-balanced diet. And, and I think um, in general, just making sure that you're getting a, a wide diversity of plants and um, lentils and legumes, I think that that should be the key. Okay. Um, Anu, what about introducing greenhouses and solar for heating uh, into the municipal network for extending growing season for particular fruits and vegetables? I mean, I think that that would, uh, it would be regionally dependent. You know, it, you'd have to do a life cycle assessment to see what what is the the energy cost of, of keeping those. Um, we actually did a comparison of indoor vertical farming. Um, and the reality is the greenhouse gases uh, associated with your food is so much of it is driven by your grains and meat that the things that you can grow within greenhouses, the things you know, like some vegetables and so on, their impact, the, the greenhouse gas impact of your diet is dominated by meat, by milk, by grains, and then very, very little is fruits and veggies. And so, yes, you could extend it. The types of things you want, you really can't grow grains at scale within greenhouse gases. So you can improve the local production, like I said, for other reasons, but if you want to get your uh, carbon footprint down, it's those big things, meat by far, dairy and dairy-based project products, grain, fruits and vegetables are very small proportion of our diet. So I think it's a great idea for other reasons. Like if you wanted to promote a local economy, if you wanted to provide fresh fruits and vegetables to an underserved community, th those would be all the reasons, but particularly for carbon footprint, it doesn't have that much. So I'm gonna have one last question um, and then I'm gonna open it to uh, all three of you. Um, and before I turn back over to Christine to, to, to wrap up our event. Um, so we barely mentioned COVID, Sarah mentioned it a couple of times, but clearly the events of the last few months and the, the events of the last couple of weeks around social equity uh, has been very much on our minds. So what, uh, just as a general question to the three of you, what learnings have we gained from these recent events around COVID-19 and all of its ramifications, having to do with food insecurity and not being able to go out and go to restaurants, and cooking at home, um, and the events that happened over the last couple of weeks about um, about some social inequities. What, are, what learnings can we apply to making our food system more sustainable from, you know, from top to bottom, from beginning to end? And uh, whoever wants to take it first, go for it. I can maybe say a little bit that food insecurity it is systemic, the inequities we're talking about. So what you're seeing with health, with COVID, is related to income, it's related to race, it's related to how many of our service employees who could not social distance at home, you know, who could not be quarantined at home. Um, so all of these are tied in to the same types of inequities and inequalities that we see. So I think thinking about social justice and equity systemically across all sectors, um, education, health, energy access, food access, health, you know, they, they're all related. And in that sense, I think one of the first things in Minneapolis and other cities is you want to engage the communities that are most 
hurt by these things into the planning process. And so for cities to work to do that is, is the first step to build the trust to, and, and to make it worthwhile. You know, why would people come to a food action plan or anything else if they're not seeing it, you know, if they're not feeling their representation. And then the other thing is to make some of the data visible. Uh, one of the things we heard from communities was that, oh, this type of data they would really like to have to advocate for their cause. So the extent to which researchers can support, it doesn't have to be supporting that cause, but make their data available so that whoever wants to use it can use it readily would be helpful. And I do think more thought about local food systems, planning them around equity rather than around quantity of food or anything else, but really saying an equity first planning what would that look like versus planning for overall greenhouse gas mitigation? I think it would shift the paradigm in your plan. I, I, I keep thinking back to your slides about gardening and the impact it has on well-being and yes. I'm thinking about not just well-being for the individual, especially in times of COVID and, and our, our shelter at home, but also the community well-being as mechanisms right. for people to come together and to, to do some good. Sarah, you comment? Yeah, I, I know we're over time, so I won't, I'll be very brief. Um, but I think what most of us aren't realizing is that these systematic inequities are across the world. And, um, and one, you know, in the specific, specifically in the food system, and one of those uh, manifestations of it is this you know, COVID-19 issue. This started because of a food system issue. It started because um, wet markets in China were, you know, um, providing meat that was wild. And who are the people who purchase from those wet markets? Are the people who are, you know, um, kind of disenfranchised and, um, you know, don't have uh, the money to purchase from a, a different place. And so I think that, you know, these issues of, um, you know, food, food um, systems and how they relate to people with um, less income and how food is a human right and we need to make sure that it's available and it's safe for everyone. I think that is um, something that is, is just, um, you know, beyond a question, right? And we need to make sure that um, we do that both in the United States and the, as well as the entire world because this is absolutely this is the globe has become tiny and we every everything affects each other and so we need to make sure that we're working on, to create a sustainable system for for everybody. Karina, do you have any last words? You're on mute. Going off of mute. Uh, I'll be as brief as possible. I'd like to underscore both what Sarah and Anu have said, especially regarding children and schools. And I'd love to see more programs uh, getting good meals um, and, and food sent home in backpacks, good fruit and vegetables sent home in backpacks with kids in underserved areas. Great. Okay, so I know that we've run over time. I think it was well worth it. And I again want to thank all of our speakers. Um, it was a great overview of a, something that's very close and near and dear to all of us and how we can really make a difference individually for ourselves, for our families, for our community and for the world by thinking more about food and its impact on, on the planet that we live in. So um, did you, Christine, did you wanna have any last uh, Yes, um, last I words? echo my thanks. Um, I have to say it, but you've given us a lot of food for thought. Um, but uh, if folks who are still with us joined late, um, we wanna make sure that you know that this was recorded on YouTube and um, on our website uh, shortly tomorrow or the day after, we'll have um, the presentations that were presented this evening and other information, including the resources that were shared tonight. Um, but with that, I will again say thank you and we will bring this presentation to a close and everyone stay safe. <laughs>